Hello everyone and welcome to Erlang 2021. I am Matthew Allen Lebrun and today I will be giving a presentation on Graph, General Purpose Raft Consensus in Elixir. This presentation has an accompanying research paper worked on by myself, Duncan Paul Attard and Adrian Frank Alonso. Our tool, Graft, is open source and available on GitHub and the Hex Package Manager at the links indicated on screen. This presentation will be split as such. I will start off by describing consensus and fault tolerance, and then lean into Raft, the consensus algorithm used by our tool. I will then talk about Graft and how it can be used to build distributed and fault tolerant applications in Elixir. I will complement this with an example demonstrating how Graph can be used to build a distributed and fault tolerant key value store. Finally, I will end the presentation with a discussion on the verification techniques used to support Graph's correctness. Consensus is used to provide fault tolerance to distributed applications. Fault tolerance refers to an application's ability to achieve its expected output in spite of failures occurring during its runtime. A basic analogy of this is taking a backup of a completed document. Notice, the backup is a redundant operation and is not necessary to complete the document. However, with it, fault tolerance up to one failure is provided, that is, a failure in either the original or backed up copy. For distributed systems, consensus algorithms are used to provide a degree of fault tolerance. The redundancy observed is through the replication of one machine's actions across multiple machines that together form a consensus cluster. Note that the consensus algorithms can only provide a degree of fault tolerance. That is to say that there is an upper bound on the number of failures that can be supported without consequence. This upper bound will vary according to the algorithm in use and the assumptions they make. A very popular yet somewhat infamous example is the Paxos consensus algorithm. Paxos is notoriously difficult to understand and even more so to implement correctly in practice. Much research has been carried out to attempt to simplify Paxos in order to ease correct implementation of the algorithm, however with limited success. This is what inspired Raft, a consensus algorithm with the primary design focus of understandability. Raft provides fault tolerance up to f failures for a cluster of 2f plus 1 nodes, whilst assuming a fair stop model. This means that Raft equates failures to node crashes, since the fail stop model assumes that any failure will immediately crash the node on which it occurs. Therefore, as long as a simple majority of nodes in a Raft cluster are running, then the distributed application should provide expected outputs. Raft uses the replicated state machine approach meaning that every node in a cluster can be viewed as if it were a state machine that has uh, its own start state and transitions to other states based on commands that are sent to it. Raft keeps track of all the transitions that the state machines perform by storing a total history of all the commands sent to the machines in an ordered list, known as the log. This log is replicated and kept consistent across every node in the cluster. Raft achieves its levels of understandability through two main techniques. The first is the use of a strong leader, meaning at any given time, one and only one, central node should govern the entirety of the consensus cluster. This centralizes many of the algorithm's operations. Secondly, Raft can be decomposed into independent subproblems. In the coming slides, I will briefly overview two of these subproblems, the leader election and log replication protocols. 
For these illustrations, it is important to note that nodes in a raft cluster can be in one of three states at any point in time, these being the follower, candidate, or leader states. Leaders, as previously mentioned, govern the main operations of the cluster. Candidates are nodes attempting to become leaders, whilst followers are passive members that only respond to incoming messages. Let's take a look at the leader election protocol. Consider a cluster of three nodes. With this interactive example, I demonstrate how these followers will notice that no leader is active, hold an election, and finally elect a leader. I will pause the demonstration to explain whenever necessary. Raft initializes followers with randomized timeouts. These timeouts are used by followers to determine whenever no leader is currently active in the cluster. In this example, note that the topmost node is going to be the first to time out. Upon timing out, the node starts an election. This means that it immediately promotes itself to candidate and sends out request vote messages to all other nodes in the cluster. Then the followers refresh their timeouts in order to prevent extra elections. They follow this up with a reply that acknowledges the receipt of the vote and also sends the successful vote back to the candidate. Upon receiving a simple majority of votes, the candidate promotes itself to leader and starts to govern the rest of the cluster. Note that the follower timeouts have not stopped. This is so that in the case of the in case the leader dies, one of the remaining nodes will find out and hold a new election. However, to prevent unnecessary elections whilst the current leader is still alive, heartbeat messages are sent to all followers in the cluster. This simply instructs nodes to refresh their timeouts. This process is repeated periodically and indefinitely, as long as the leader is alive. Now, let's take a look at the log replication protocol. The goal of this protocol is to accept client requests, replicate the command sent by the client across all logs in the cluster, and execute the command to yield its return value, which is then sent back to the client as a response. Let's take a look at this in action. The client starts by making a request to the leader of the consensus cluster, with the command C to be executed on the replicated state machine. Once received, the leader appends the command to its local log without executing it. It then sends append entries messages to all other nodes in the cluster, indicating the commands sent in the client requests. Once received, followers append the entry to their local logs, also without executing it. After this, an acknowledgement is sent back to the leader, indicating the success of appending the entry. Upon realizing the entry, uh, that the entry has been replicated across a simple majority of nodes, the leader finally executes the command, yielding its return value. This is then sent back to the client as a response to its request. And the next heartbeat message sent out by the leader, all other nodes in the cluster will notice that the command is safe to be applied to their local machines. That concludes the demonstration of Raft. And so now I move on to Graft, our tool for building distributed and fault-tolerant applications in Elixir using the Raft algorithm. We split Graft into three main components, the API, behavior, and configuration. I will discuss each of these separately, starting from Graft's API. Graft exposes a minimal API with two functions. 
The graph.start function takes no arguments and simply starts the raft protocol on all nodes that have been configured as the consensus cluster. The graph.request function takes two parameters. The first is the server node to which the request is sent. And the second is the command that should be executed on the state machine. Graft also exposes a behavior using its graft.machine module. This behavior specifies two callbacks that should be overridden. The first is the init callback. Notice that this resembles very much the implementation of a gen server or gen state machine, which also needs an init callback specification. In case of graft, the init callback takes one parameter, which is a list of arguments that can be passed to it in case additional information is needed for its initialization process. This callback should return the starting state of the state machine. The second callback, handle entry, takes two parameters. The first should pattern match to the command sent by the client using the graph.request function. And the second is the state which captures the current state of the machine. This callback should return a tuple which contains the response for the client and the newly updated state. For configuration, Graft uses Elixir's config module. The attributes that can be configured are as such. The cluster is a list of nodes that form the consensus cluster. Then, the module which uses the graph.machine behavior should also be specified, along with any arguments that are passed to its init function. Finally, server timeouts and heartbeat timeouts can be specified in the configuration list. Using these three components, let's now build an example of a distributed and fault-tolerant key-value store. We start by building a simple API for our diskv. In our diskv module, we specify two functions. The first, start, simply calls graph.start, which in turn starts the raft protocol on every node specified in our configuration list. The second function, put, will be used to put a key and value inside our distributed KV store. This function takes three parameters, a server, the key, and the value. This function builds the command that is sent to our state machine. The command is as such, a three tuple with the atom put, the key, followed by the value. Finally, it calls the graph.request function, specifying the server SRV and our command com. In a separate module, we specify the use of the graph.machine behavior. This indicates that we should override the init and handle entry callbacks in order to specify the behavior of our state machine. Since no necessary information is required, the init callback will take uh, an empty list as its parameter. It then returns a tuple with OK and an empty map, this map being the starting state of our machine. The second callback, handle entry, specifies two parameters. The first is a tuple with the at input and variables k and v, corresponding to the key and value. The second parameter is s, representing the state of the machine. This function specifies a response for the client, which is an OK atom, and a new updated state for the machine, stored in new state, and this is simply the key and value put inside of our state s, using the map.put function, both returned as a tuple. Notice that this function exactly pattern matches to the command specified in our put API function, the tree tuple of the atom put, the key, and the value. 
Finally, all that's left for our application is to configure it. This example will use a cluster of three nodes, these being server 1, server 2, and server 3, that reside on S1, S2, and S3 on local host respectively. We specify the machine to be the diskkv.machine module. This is where we specified our behavior, uh, the use of the graph.machine behavior. And we also indicate that an empty list of arguments should be passed to our init function. Finally, we specify a server timeout and heartbeat timeout in milliseconds. Now that we have built our example, let's hop into an interactive Elixir session to test it out. We'll start off by calling this kv.start. This returns a list of three OKs, one for each successfully started raft protocol on every node. OK, now that raft is started, let's go ahead and put something in our kv store. We do this using this kv.put. We'll send the request to server one, we'll use the key Erlang and the value 2021. This returns OK. Remember, this corresponds exactly to the response message we defined inside our handle entry callback. I've taken the liberty to go ahead and extend the example to include a fetch functionality so that we can see that the key and value have actually been placed inside our KV store. Let's try it out. Calling this kv.fetch, we send the request to server one with the key Erlang. This does indeed return the value of the, uh, of the KV pair we placed inside our store on line two, that is 2021. Recall that Raft supports fault tolerance up to F failures for a cluster of two F plus one nodes. This means that if we were to go ahead and crash this interactive Elixir session, we can go ahead and access the session for server two. Given that server two and server three are still alive, we should still be able to call our put and fetch functions on to our kv store. Let's go ahead and call this kv.fetch. We'll send the request to server 2 with the key Erlang. This does indeed return 2021, as a simple majority of nodes in our cluster, 2 out of 3, are still operational. For the full example, I address anyone interested to my GitHub. What makes Graft unique compared to other generic purpose implementations of Raft is its use of runtime monitors as post-deployment safety guarantees. These monitors compare the execution trace observed at runtime with a formally defined property in order to runtime verify the consensus protocol. We formalize a number of properties in a module new calculus based off of the invariance of the Raft algorithm. We then use the Erlang tool detector to automatically synthesize monitors in Erlang based off of the formalized properties. If so wished, the monitors run alongside the graph application, observing the consensus communication to determine whether any action violates these formalized properties. Let's take a closer look at how detector monitors work. Detector monitors can be seen as two separate components, a tracer and a monitor. The tracer uses Erlang's inbuilt tracing functionalities to capture incoming and outgoing messages of a process. Consider the node in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. If this node were to receive a message 1, the tracer will capture this message, forward it to the monitor, which observes the message and checks whether it violates property P. If no violation is present, it simply waits for the next event to occur. If the process sends out a 
the message. The tracer once again captures the message, forwards it to the monitor, and the monitor again observes the message in relation to a follow-up to event 1. If no violation occurs, it simply waits for the next event yet again. Let's consider now a third message incoming into our process. The tracer captures it, forwards it to the monitor, and the monitor observes it in relation to the history of events 1, 2, and 3. If the monitor deems that this occurrence of actions violates priority P, it will return a violation. This allows developers to manually inspect the trace of events as observed by the process in order to determine where the violation may have occurred. This concludes the presentation. I remind you that Graft is open source and available on GitHub at this location, and that this presentation has an accompanying paper which goes into more details about Raft and how we implemented it in Elixir in a generic way. It also covers a performance analysis of our tool, which shows that Graft is comparable in performance to other state-of-the-art implementations. I thank you all for listening, and I will now happily take any questions you may have.